All right, hello everyone, uh, and congratulations for making it to the end of the universe. <laughs> Took me a really long time to get here, so I, I appreciate you guys doing that as well. We're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about Swift storage today, and I have uh, I have my name is Varun Chabra. I'm a product marketer at EMC, and uh, I work on uh, an object storage platform that that EMC has. Also helping me today is John Chilton. John, say hi. John's going to be helping me with some of the demos. I know it's just before lunch, and I'm sure you guys are all hungry. Uh, so I'm going to try my best not to bore you with too many slides. We're gonna, we have three demos for you guys. Uh, it's going to be pretty quick, and we want to make it interactive. So please stop me if you have any questions. All right. So um, what are we? What you know? What are we hearing from customers as as it pertains to storage? And I think the the biggest thing that I hear uh, when I'm talking to customers is that. The, the notion of you know, whether it's platform three apps, cloud native apps, buy modal IT, pick your, you know, pick your buzzword, uh, what it's fundamentally doing to infrastructure uh, is that the requirements we have of you know, storage infrastructure and other kinds of infrastructure is very different. These applications have different requirements than what traditional platform two applications have. And one of the things that, that's happening a lot with storage especially with applications like cloud native applications, you know, mobile applications, data coming in from sensors, uh, you know, a large amounts of data coming from social media or from, from your line of businesses, a lot of this data is unstructured. Right? You, you've all heard that unstructured data is growing much faster than, than structured data. By the way, do, does everybody here know what unstructured data is? Okay, good. Uh, so you know, I've seen numbers like unstructured data is growing to be 80% of the total amount of data, all of the growth and overall amount of data is, is happening through unstructured data. And what this is doing is it's really stressing out uh, resources that, that you, know, you have in your, in your data center. Right? Uh, so one is capacity. The other thing is how these applications actually work. Right? They, they, they have very, very different requirements. Uh, you know, they, they depend more on, on app resiliency. There isn't as much of a focus on things like infrastructure resiliency like uh, you know, high availability and disaster recovery, those notions are really changing in this new world. So what, what all of this means is we need a different kind of storage platform to address the growth of unstructured data, to, uh, to really help uh, our application, you know, a lot of the application developers among this audience that are looking to develop these, these cloud native applications, you really need a different infrastructure. And, you know, the question then becomes, well, what would this, you know, what, what, what really are the tenants of such a storage platform, right? So the, the, the few things that we find that we hear from customers again and again, it has to be hardware agnostic, right? So it has to be software defined. I have to be able to run on my existing hardware uh, if, I, if that's what I want to do. And we certainly see a lot of customers that are asking for that. It has to be able to scale at a really large, large, large exabyte level, right? Even more. Uh, and we're finding that there's just, Keeping up with the storage growth and doing it at an economical cost is, is hard, right? So you have to be able to scale, and it doesn't have to break your bank. It has to be multilingual. You know, what that means is it has to speak English, French, and Spanish. Oh, wait, no, never mind. Sorry, wrong session. It has to be able to speak different protocols. So APIs like, uh, you know, everybody supports Swift, uh, especially in this conference, right? Um, but you need to be able to support S3, uh, you know, just all the REST APIs that are out there that customers are looking for, that developers are looking for. Because you know, if you're developing an application for Amazon and you're using S3, we, we often find that over time, storage costs for, you know, Amazon is great. It's very, very easy to get you started. You swipe your credit card and you start putting your data in there. Awesome, you, know, you become a hero for you know, your division, got things going really fast. What happens over time is you know, more and more data goes to Amazon, more and more data goes to Amazon, and every time somebody in your, you know, whether it's your end customer or whether it's your internal business units, they access that data, there's you know, egress costs, right? And then if you're running mission critical workloads, which, which all of you are in the cloud, you start having to pay for network leasing, right? you have to worry about bandwidth and all of those things, and the costs really add up. So a lot of customers, they come back to us and they say, well, I've, I've architected this application for S3, can I just drop something in for uh, you know, for, uh, for on-premises. The same way, you may be using a service provider that, that's using OpenStack, so you're writing to Swift. So you have to be able to drop in those things. So the, the, the platform has to be multilingual, it has to be able to handle all these different APIs, so that you can 
you know, you, you kind of decouple yourself from the hardware and you can focus on, as, an, as a developer, you can focus on writing an application that drives your business forward. Uh, 3x replication. So a lot of vendors that you talk to will say, well, you need 3x replication. You know, the data has to be secure, I have to replicate it across all these things, which is great. Uh, you know, replication is important, but it, there's a lot of storage inefficiency that comes in with replicating three copies of your data, right? Especially as we start talking about, you know, petabytes of data that your business is generating on, an, on you know, a monthly or an yearly business, your storage inefficiency starts adding up pretty fast. So uh, we believe there is a better way to actually manage this, right? And we'll talk a little bit about this, uh, but, uh, you know, there's, we do a lot of erasure coding, which is basically a fancy way of saying XOR. You know, you're XORing different bits together, and you're using that, and, then, and we believe that that gives us a much higher storage efficiency while giving you the same level of resiliency that, that something like replication would do. Finally, uh, or at least on this side of the column, it has to be multi-tenant, right? Everybody knows what multi-tenancy is, so I'm not gonna waste time on that one. Um, it has to be van efficient. What that means is, you know, you're, you're gonna be pulling data off the internet all the time. I was talking to somebody at the, at the EMC booth yesterday and they were talking about, uh, you know, they have so much data that, that they are basically ingesting uh, and, and they're basically sending out that, that their network throughput and the costs are, are becoming an issue even in their own data center. So it has to be able to do something that's, uh, you know, makes it easy, it's van efficient, you don't have to, you know, chunk things together and send everything over. Um, active active architectures are, are you know a big deal, and this goes hand in hand with sort of the, my point about replication. The the old world of you know having a primary and a backup, you know, it's just not efficient, right? What you, what customers are looking for, and what developers are looking for, it should just work. You know, I, I'm going to write to, uh, you know, if you have a, if you have a mobile app, and you have customers all over the world or, or in different geographies, and you have a data center. Let's say you have a data center in Japan, and you have a data center in in the U.S. You know the 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 mobile app user in Japan has to be able to write to uh, you know, the, the Japanese data center for the best experience, right? And there shouldn't be this notion of what's my primary, what's my backup, how do I fail over, et cetera, et cetera. So, so all of those things are very important as well. Related to that, it has to be geo-accessible, right? So take Facebook. You know, I like a photo on Facebook today, and then I have friends in India who, you know, or, or update a photo on, on, or a post a comment, my friends in India should be able to see that comment right away, right? But what's actually happening behind uh, is that there's a, you know, Facebook has a data center here. They have a data center ostensibly somewhere in Asia, maybe in India. And uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to get the data to be synchronized, right? So, so um, having that, that being able to, not only being able to access this data across geographies, but also having it be strongly consistent, right? So there's this notion of consistency. A lot of vendors that you will hear from will talk about eventual consistency. I'll update, uh, I'll update something in this data center and it will eventually, you know, 10, 15 minutes later, it'll get updated, maybe even longer across, uh, you know, the other side. And uh, that's, we don't think that's good enough. Uh, we think that, we, you know, as you, uh, as if you, if someone, if one of a user's writes data in one area, it has to be instantly, you know, laws of physics being obeyed, it has to be updated uh, right away on, on the other side of the world because that's really what your customers are asking for or your end users rather. And then the last thing is um, this notion of st uh, st large and, and small files. You know, back when uh, EMC started sort of the object market with Centera, did, does anybody remember Centera, right? Uh, you know, it's it's a 12-year-old platform at this point. At, time, at this point, uh, it's still going strong. You know, a lot of customers are still using it a lot. But the notion of what object storage was and what the needs of object storage were at that point in time are very different from what they are today. Back then, it was about large files. Right, you have really, really large files uh, that that the system needs to be able to handle. Today, that's not the the majority of the data you're getting. The majority of the data that you're getting is unstructured. It's very, very small. Right, it's like 10 to 40 kilobytes, maybe even smaller. And it's, it's large, uh, not in size, but in quantity, right? So you're getting a lot of that. So the way you write, you know, small files pose a very unique challenge for um, a, a lot of object vendors because you know, a lot of them were architected back uh, when large files were, they were optimized for large files. When you start doing things like erasure coding and you break things up, uh, there's overhead added. And to be able to do that, that efficiently for small files is difficult. It imposes, uh, you know, a lot of vendors will basically, when they're writing small files, they're doing erosion coding or checksums and things like that, and the write operation ends up taking a lot of time, right? So, so the platform has to be able to handle both large and small files. 
right? So uh, efficiently, it should provide the same experience and, and all of those things. Okay, so you know, in a nutshell, what we are seeing is a platform like this would be you know, right on the top. It, it's able to support a bunch of different workloads, whether it's more traditional workloads like archiving to the cloud, right? Basic, basic archiving, uh, backing, backing up, tiering, or whatever. Uh, being able to use you know file workloads, right? Um, files. A, a lot of applications are written using NFS or SIFS, uh, and you know the the traditional NAS platforms of yesterday. They aren't able to scale to handle. Uh, you know, geo-distributed uh, requirements or being able to do eventual consistency, global namespace, all of these things are hard for, uh, for traditional NAS systems to do. So being able to handle file uh, platforms is very important as well, file APIs is very important as well. You, know, you have mobile apps, you have packaged apps coming in, and then analytics, right? Another buzzword that gets thrown around a lot, and, and certainly people, you know, in my profession in marketing are, are guilty of that, but the reality is that a lot of customers are looking to uh, mine all of this unstructured data. It's, it's you know, it, there's some there's some usefulness in retaining this data for compliance purposes, of course. But the real value, the real competitive advantage, is is in mining this data, right? So how do you do that? How do you do that when all of this data is across the world? It's coming in really fast. It's unstructured. So so you have to be able to handle that as well. So um, you know, all of that means in the middle layer that you see here is that different APIs. These are all different APIs. You know, it has to be able to handle HDFS natively. You know, protocols like NFS without the need of a gateway, right? Because a lot of vendors will will have object storage, and then they'll ask you to slap a, an NFS gateway in front of it, right? That increases your cost. Uh, you have to be able to handle Swift, right? And you have to be able to handle S3. So, so for us, uh, that's really what's been driving uh, what we're doing with uh, our object storage platform. It's called ECS. It's Elastic Cloud Storage. And uh, you know what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop talking, uh, stop talking as much, I guess. Uh, we're going to talk about demos, right? So we want to show you three demos that really go through uh, some of these capabilities, right? They're very straightforward demos, but we want to we want to make sure that you're not just seeing marketing slides. Uh, so let's start. Uh, you know, first is OpenStack integration, right? Everybody here is talking about Swift integration. I think that's great, but Swift integration is not enough. You know, to be a truly drop-in replacement for Swift, the platform has to be integrated with Keystone as well, right? Because a lot of the applications that you're writing on OpenStack, they they have reliance on Keystone, right, for identity models and, and for all of those things. So you have to be able to pull that in. And and, and, and a lot of those applications, if, if the underlying system doesn't support Keystone, it's really difficult to migrate your apps uh, to, to that platform. So we, not only do we do uh, you know, uh, compliance with Swift, of course, we're also, we're all, we've also baked in Keystone integration. So let's show you what that looks like. John, do you want to walk us through right. what we're going to see here? OK, yeah, so this is the um, integration between uh, Keystone and ECS. So here we're going to log into the ECS UI, and we'll show you what steps you need to take in order to make uh, Keystone and ECS work together. So here we've defined a new authentication provider for Keystone. And so in, in there we have to configure some of the data like the uh, Keystone server URL, which is the endpoint that we'll use to validate tokens that are received by ECS and those tokens that are generated by Keystone. And another thing that ECS needs to know about is the Swift account or the Keystone project. So we'll go into the Horizon UI and in here, we'll navigate to the uh, projects section, and we'll look for the, uh, the demo project. And to do the mapping to ECS, we'll use the, the project ID for the demo project itself. And with that ID, we'll go back into ECS, and we'll create a corresponding namespace with that same value. So this is what allows the mapping from a Swift account to uh, an ECS. So ECS understands it in terms of a, a namespace. So here we have it. The demo project is created inside of ECS, just to validate that. And now we can go back. Uh, I guess we're doing our validation. It's there. It's the ID. And go back into our Horizon UI. And we're just seeing that the user that's logged in is the admin user you can see in the upper, upper right corner, and they're in the demo project. So 
actions from the Horizon UI that will access the object store later will go through this. But in order for Horizon to know where the object store is, it needs to know where the object store endpoint is. So you can register the ECS node as the object store. And so that any queries to the service catalog looking for the object store know to go to the ECS node here. And we're just going to go show you that the node ending in 208 is in fact the, uh, the same ECS node that we uh, saw earlier when we configured the, um, the uh, auth provider in the namespaces. So now that all, all object store service requests will be going to the ECS node. So now within the uh, Horizon UI, you can navigate to the little UI they have for the object store where you can create containers and objects. So here we see that we don't have any containers for the demo namespace, I'm sorry, the demo project. And now, <coughs> excuse me, in the corresponding namespace in ECS, we'll just validate we don't have anything there as well. So now we'll go back into the Horizon and we'll create a container creatively named container one, and we'll create that. And then we'll see that that container is actually has been created on ECS. So in there, we should see it here. And there's a container sitting on ECS, which is the same container that you're seeing through Horizon. And you could also upload content through the Horizon UI. So we'll pick a uh, file, there may be a pretty picture of hydrangeas and we'll upload that to, through Horizon, and that's actually being stored on ECS through using the Swift APIs. And so now we'll go to ECS and verify that. To do this, we'll use Cyberduck, which is another tool that can access uh, Swift APIs. And we have a bookmarked uh, configuration. We'll just open that up just to verify that we're still talking to the ECS. And you can see that it's, it's the uh, 208, again, if you recognize that from the earlier UI. And this is the demo project ID. So all requests here will be issued to that uh, thing. So there's the container one. And we should see in here the hydrangeas JPEG. And it can perform some other operations in the Horizon UI, such as we can remove the object. <coughs> Pardon me. And then we should see that object also has been removed off of ECS as well. So we'll do a refresh with CyberDuck. And uh, I think, so there you see sort of the seamless integration between uh, Keystone and ECS. Thanks, John. So next up, so as I said, it's, you know, Swift integration, Keystone integration is, is important. A lot of you are probably writing apps for S3 as well. Right? So you want to be able to provide um, Compatibility with the S3 API. So what we're going to show you here is, um, you know, on one side, making edits using using Swift, and then seeing them through uh, through S3, and basically making sure that uh, you know the data is the same. And, and the reason why this is important is some of the vendors that that are in this market, the way that they handle different APIs is uh, they actually create silos of data, right? So oh, this is all my Swift data. This is all my HDFS data. And then, you know, when you're trying to get the, the data to work together, you actually have to work across different silos. And, and I think uh, that really defeats the purpose of having a flat hierarchy of an object platform, right? You really need to, need to treat all the data the same. And that's really what we're doing here. And that's uh, quickly, let's show you what, what that looks like. All right, so here we have um, two different tools to access the two different APIs. We have CyberDuck and S3 Browser. S3 browser, of course, accesses the uh, AW, uh, the S3 APIs, and CyberDuck is for the uh, Swift APIs, and they're both going to connect to ECS. So CyberDuck will connect to to ECS, and then we'll go, you know, show you that in um, S3 browser that there is also nothing there, and so we go back to CyberDuck using the Swift APIs. We will create a container, and then that same container will be, you know accessible through the um, S3 APIs and by using the S3 browser. So there's a container, and now back in S3 browser, there's the same container. Now, just want to emphasize, they're actually the same container, not uh, somehow copies of each other. Yep. So in S3 here, we're going to put content into that container. This is show that it's sort of bi-directional. Um, so we're going to put in another picture 
a lighthouse, and so I'm New England based. Although, so and then we'll see that that same lighthouse is now in Swift, accessible through the Swift API, which is the same the same JPEG. And so here through uh, Cyberduck, we're going to do a little edit to the lighthouse, and then we'll put the edit back in, and then you'll see that change reflected back in on the uh, S3 side. So here we're going to do a little adjustment to that. Um, it's going to desaturate it, make it black and white, finding the right slider. All right, there it is. All right, so now I'm going to just save it as a more dramatic black and white photo. And then we go back into S3, and then we can see that the change is reflected back in the, on the S3 APIs. And we'll see that the lighthouse is now black and white. And that, that just shows you the, uh, the cross-ed capabilities between S3 and Swift. And then we can also delete it, and you'll see that that same file is now removed. And it's removed, you, know, you can see that it's removed from both APIs. All right, great. So, so John, what you're saying is if you have an app that's writing uh, to the Swift API, mm -hmm. and then you have another app that's writing data to your object store using S3, Either app can access the data. Correct. It doesn't right. matter which it, what, what right. way it comes Right, the same in. data. You're just using two different APIs yep. to, uh, to access it or manipulate it. Got it. Okay. Um, and finally, two parts, two other things that uh, we want to talk about is one is NFS, right? A lot of, a lot of customers that we're talking today, they have uh, traditional file-based applications, and they're looking to modernize these applications, right? They want to be able to use those applications uh, to really want to be able to extend their file data across a global namespace. And, and for those of you that have worked with NAS systems, you know how hard slash impossible that is, right, in a, in a, in a global environment with data centers that are all over the world. So um, being able to do that, not only handle NFS data, but also be able to treat it just like an object store where you're, you're applying a global namespace to it is, um, is something that, that a lot of customers and developers will find value in. So what we're going to show you here is two separate, uh, uh, two separate sites, Right, and ECS is sitting on both sides, and we're going to write to one site using Swift, and then we're going to pull that data from another site using NFS. And uh, so, John, do you want to show us what, what's happening All here? All right. So here we're just going to show you in the uh, ECS UI that we have two sites that are defined, and we'll just try to keep track of you know some of the IPs associated with them, just to refer back to later. So here we're going to just navigate into where our sites are defined. Um, so we have sites one and sites two, and just keep note that site one ends in 208, and that site, site one ends in 208, and site two ends in 107. So we'll just show you those in different uh, tools. So here in Cyberduck, again, we have you know, connections defined for each of those different sites. And this and, one- And Cyberduck is the Swift. Cyberduck is, Swift is, is the, uh, right, yeah. accessing the Swift APIs, right. And so this is site one for 208, and site two here is defined for connection to 107. So first thing we're gonna do is now we're gonna connect it uh, to site one, and we're gonna see that we already have a container defined. Now think about this container, it's been configured now to be accessible as, a, you know, in, in, as an NFS uh, file system. So now this is an Ubuntu, we can mount that same container we just saw called Crosshead. And just note here that we're on 208, which is the equivalent of site one now. And there's the, uh, the container named Crosshead. So we'll mount it. And so now we're mounting that container. So the data in the container and the data on the mount are the same. So from Ubuntu, we're just gonna navigate into that using the, the uh, file explorer Go to the uh, mount directory, and we'll show you that there's nothing in there. And so what we're going to do now is going to add, add some content in there. So we go to our text editor and add something pithy, like hello world, and then we'll save that off. And then we'll give it a navigate to our directory, and then we're going to save it. We'll give it a name first. Hello.txt, right? Now, after we save it, we can go, we'll be going into Cyberduck, and you'll see that, that that change is reflected on the Swift APIs as well. So it's the same file, then it'll be accessible via the uh, Swift API. So here we are, back in Cyberduck, refresh, 
there it is. And so we'll just open up to verify that the content that we wrote on Ubuntu is the same content that we have here through the Swift API, and it is. All right, so now that we're in a multi-site environment, we're going to disconnect from site one, and then we're going to reconnect to site two and just show you that the, that the data is actively propagated to site two and that the hello text there is the same hello text that we created in Ubuntu. And yes, there it is. And so well, while we're here, we're just going to do a little edit um, just to make it maybe a little more contemporary. Hello from the other site. I thought I was going to say side, right? All right. So we'll save that from site two. And then, you know, the, uh, the highly consistent aspect of ECS will mean that site one, which is the Ubuntu mount, will be able to see that reflected in the file itself. So we'll open up the hello text and we'll see the changes that were made through CyberDuck from site two. And there they are, hello from the other site. And we can do one more thing, we'll just delete it. And then we'll show that that delete is also reflected immediately over to the site two, which CyberDuck is already connected to. So if we do a refresh, we'll see that it is gone. And uh, that concludes that. All right, thank you, John. So Let's, uh, let's just take a step back and recap what, what we showed you. So first, not just Swift integration, but also Keystone integration. So you can drop in your apps uh, that are written for OpenStack seamlessly. Um, after that, it's not just about Swift, also S3. So if you have other apps that are writing to S3 uh, and you have apps that are writing to Swift, they're going to be able to access the same data. It makes no difference to how the platform doesn't treat them any differently. Right? And then finally, you're looking to modernize your, your NFS apps or file apps. You can point them to the object store. It speaks NFS. And not only that, it can actually, you know, those two sites, they could have been a world apart, right? And the data would be updated. Any changes made on one side would be updated, um, you know, as long as uh, speed of light laws are obeyed almost instantaneously. So that those, are, those are some of the things that we think really differentiate what our platform does, right? And, and you know, all of you are writing, uh, potentially writing applications to Swift. And what we, want, what we think we're doing here is taking uh, Swift to the next level. So you have strong consistency. You saw that already reflecting changes across sites very quickly. Uh, high efficiency, you know, we didn't, we didn't talk about that more than the, the initial part, but uh, really being able to uh, go away from the modality of sort of 3x replication or 2x replication or whatever it is that, that we're doing from a replication perspective to something that's a far lower overhead, right? So with, with ECS, you can, get, um, you can get overheads for, you know, in, in a, uh, up to 1.2 or 1.3x, right? So as low as that, right? So you can really reduce the, the amount of storage you need uh, to back up your data and, and, and have it stored in a resilient format. Um, you need to be able to scale, right? We, we talked about it. We have, we have many customers that are deploying, you know, multi-petabyte environments in ECS. Uh, and, and really, there's, there's no limitation to scale. It's a scale-out It's a scale -out platform. You know, you keep adding more nodes, whether it's our turnkey appliance or, uh, you know, your own server, you can keep just scaling up. And then uh, developer productivity is a really, really big deal in this new environment, right? It's not just about uh, what, what, what we do for uh, the folks on the operation side. It's also making sure that life becomes easier for, for a lot of the developers in the audience. So having that multi-protocol support makes it easy for you to decide whatever works best for your application. Uh, you know, you, you can be assured that the data will be written, um, you know, all the same and you will be able to read data that's, been com that's coming in from other systems as well. So whether if you're running an analytics app that's ingesting all the data that's coming in from your line of businesses and you want to run uh, you know, Hadoop on it, you, can, uh, you, can you, know, you want to run MapReduce, you can, you can do all of that stuff regardless of how that data came in, where it came from, you can be assured that the platform is going to take care of all of that for you. So as, a, as an application developer, you don't have to worry about those things. So that's... Uh, that's you know ECS in a nutshell. Uh, I don't think we have. Yeah, one last thing. Uh, like I said to you before, uh, ECS is available as we, we think that software-defined storage is a really really important part of of providing choice to our customers. So ECS can be downloaded as a as a software version uh, that you can run on you know supported hardware, 
And then there's also, there's also a turnkey appliance if you want to get started right away. And essentially, you know, we told you a lot of stuff. You don't need to take our word for it. You can actually go and download um, the, uh, the, the ECS uh, free and frictionless download. It's an unlimited use uh, download, uh, not for production workloads, but basically, you, you know, it's, uh, you can deploy a container using a container. You can basically deploy ECS in your environment. You can, you can test it out and, uh, you know, see if it meets your needs. There's also an ECS community that you'll see once you go to this link uh, where you, know, you can ask, ask questions and, and people on our team will answer them as well. Uh, if, you, if you don't want to download something, you can actually go to our sandbox environment. So we have a test drive uh, environment as well that somebody can go in and, and play around with the, uh, with, with the platform. So um, I'll stop there. Questions from the audience? Please. Yes, so, um, so uh, maybe Denis will have to help me out here. Denis, uh, how do we handle uh, permissions across the different APIs? I mean, it's basically all configured using the portal, right? The, the ECS portal? Yeah, so, so we, re we reflect them. Uh, That's okay, I can, uh, yeah. You, do you want to take John's uh, mic? Yeah. Thanks, Denis. Any other questions? Um, you talked about uh, strong consistency and, and the high availability. Can you talk about, um, in terms of if you had network failures or a network partition between site one and site two, would you just block writes from site one if a user is trying to write to site one? To how, how does that work? So, so what you're saying is, if if for some reason there's a network failure or one of the sites goes down. How do you handle the 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 writes across the? Or not the, the site go okay. down, but you just have a network where you can't. Site one cannot yeah. communicate to site two. Uh, would you block the write to site one because site two wouldn't be able to see it? How how would Perfect. that work? Okay, good question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. So um, the first the first part is the consistency. So the way we do it is on read. So basically, you write on one site. This site is considered as the owner. You read from that site, you don't care, you are the owner. You read from the other site, even if you have a local copy, we check with the first site if we have the last copy or last version and so on. So this is for consistency. And then you have to give the choice to the customer. Do I prefer consistency or availability? If you prefer consistency, then we don't give you read at all. So you, lose, you have network partition, you cannot contact the owner, I cannot check the consistency, I don't give you access. That can make sense for some use cases. And uh, the other thing is, no, I prefer availability. And in this case, we, we just like, let's say, disable the consistency check in that case. And uh, we uh, do something that is really, I think, uh, unique, is that we give you read-write access. We don't just give you read access. We give you read-write access. And basically, we transfer the ownership to the other site. So that means that imagine you have an application that writes on site one. And you have a network partition. Even if we transfer the ownership, there is no impact because there is nothing on site two. Now imagine you lose your site, then you want to move your application to site two, and you have transferred ownership, and now you're fine because you can read and write, and then we just reflect on the other site. And, so and, we, yeah. And then as an application developer, you don't have to worry about that, right? Like once the system is set up, the, it happens seamlessly. Yeah, so what we've seen in the past, because I was working on Atmos as well, which was our previous platform, is that we were uh, doing something very similar to all the other platforms in the market, which means that you cannot check you are read-only. And it was a big, uh, a big problem for adoption of object storage because many people are coming from file usage and they are used to have like a, a failover or failback. 
You know, it's very rare to have an active, active application. You have many applications in different sites, but most of them are active in one site, at least for one part of the data. Yeah. So what they want is they don't really care about this active, active access. They want to have a failover, failback, and that's what we give them. Thanks. Any, any other questions, folks? Yeah, please. Encryption. Uh, encryption. So a question about what we do for encryption. So uh, we have two different, so we, we don't do that with self-encrypted drive because many customers don't want to pay for that. So we have done that with, uh, in the software. I've seen one session this morning, I think that it was, you are in the, you are in the room, I recognize you. And uh, that's uh, very, very similar to the implementation that's done in, uh, by the Swift community currently. So we are using like uh, keys at different level, namespace, container, object, and so on. And uh, what we have done, at, uh, you could do also in the Swift uh, community is that on the SVPI side, we give also the flexibility that uh, you can uh, use the um, encryption, uh, 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 you can provide the encryption key through the API for each object so that the application can manage itself the key. So you have two different options. Either you don't care, you want, to be done, you want that to be done by ECS itself, and then it will be just for that specific container, I want encryption and it's managed by ECS itself. Or you can say, I disable it on ECS, but I send the key whenever I need that. Or I just say, for that object, I want to activate encryption. And for that, we just follow the S3 API like Amazon is doing it. Perfect, thank you. We'll be here if you guys have more questions, but I want to do the, the raffle, which I'm sure you guys are all waiting for. Um, <laughs> let's see, okay, who's gonna get the uh, Amazon Echo? Funny, it says my name on here. All right, thanks, guys. Um, ticket number, uh, last three digits? Let's, let's do first three. We want to build a suspense. So. 970, who won? Okay, nobody. All right, so I'm going to take it. So, uh, 970384. All right, great. Come on up. All right, folks, we're here if you have more questions. Uh, and. Uh, I hit me up on Twitter if you guys want to uh, talk more, but thank you for attending.